Hi, good morning. Hello, good morning, Mr. Ciaczewski. Yes, good morning, good morning. And a good evening to you. Must be eight o'clock in exactly. Belgium. Exactly, it's uh, eight o'clock over there. Okay, yeah, let's just start. Um, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon or good evening to everyone from America, Europe, and Asia that's joining us live here today. My name is Sven van Broek, and I'm a freelance uh, investment writer for spaarbarkjes.be which is a Belgian educational blog that provides investment courses, books, and investment club memberships. And today we will do another interview with Jeff Ciaczewski, who is the CEO of Cleanbriar Capital Corp, which is a small Canadian company with a market cap of 35 million Canadian dollars that is listed on the TSX Venture Exchange in Toronto under the stock symbol GRB. This interview will be in the format of a Q&A webinar, and we have received many questions to ask to Jeff. And thanks for everybody for sending in those questions. I don't think we can cover them all, but we can certainly try. And the ones the, we cannot cover, we'll carry on over to a follow, another follow-up meeting. Participants in this webinar can also ask additional questions via the chat. However, it might be difficult for me to spot them all during the live interview. But if you cannot get to all of them, I just said they will just be carried over to another follow-up meeting. This webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to YouTube and the link to this presentation as well as an introduction to the company will be provided there as well. So we have a range of topics to cover. So at first a small disclaimer that we are providing educational content and we are not investment advisors and also a disclosure that I own shares of Greenbrier Capital Corp but I'm not compensated or paid by the company in any way. And we should always be aware that investing does contain risks. Okay. A quick overview of GRB. I'm not going into details because I have another session or slide for that. Basically, there are three projects within Greenbrier, which is Sage Ranch, a real estate housing project in the Hachapi, South California, and two solar farm projects, one in Montella, Puerto Rico, and one in Alberta, Canada. This session will have a few questions about Sage Ranch, but also about Keller Williams, Montella, Alberta, and also Captiva and Markham and Strategy have a few ones. Let's start with Sage Ranch. A lot of questions came in that uh, wanted to know more about the detailed timing, about when the project will break ground, when the precise development plan will be posted or reviewed, and following up on that, when do you expect the first phase to start? When will the first revenues arrive to GRB? So a lot of questions are about timing and how the current progress. What can you say about that, Jeff? Is your comment? Yep. Okay, so the precise development plan is a document that we file with the city mm -hmm. that incorporates all of the engineering and design attributes for what we call phase one. Now, when we talk about design, we don't mean the architectural design that the city already approved on August 17th, 2021, as related to the entitlement. It's the actual 100% engineer drawings that the general contractor can actually build the homes grade the project, build the sewer, build the water. It's the entire suite of final engineer drawings that the project can commence. So in October, we had a news release out October 20, uh, 2021. We engaged two engineering firms out of the Bakersfield area. One is uh, DeWalt, the other is Strong Engineering. And, uh, and they're doing, and they have been doing for the last seven months, the design, the actual drawings, not the design, the designs have already been done. The actual drawings of every home, the grading and the grading engineering. Again, I just want to, you know, let the audience know here that the business of wind farming or solar farming or really residential real estate designs are always done at the earlier stages. They're done to maybe a 10 or 20% level. They're not the final package that you can actually build on. So moving from the approval of the project and now moving into the permits requires these drawings to be submitted and these engineered um, details to be submitted. So we have the sewage, the water, the dry electrical, the roads, the parks, the clubhouse. I just picked up uh, hard copies of all the uh, engineered drawings for the, uh, for all of the homes in phase one. So we're getting close to having the background documents that would support what's called the precise development plan. And we think we're probably within 60 days of having that completed. Once we have that completed, we'll forward that to the city of Tehachapi. 
and it'll go through their review. And then through the review is usually uh, back and forth between the engineering team and the city. And when the city feels comfortable that the engineered plans and designs meet their standards, then they'll grant approval of the precise development plan. And that'll allow us to pull all the various permits that you need to start construction. So this is a very big undertaking. You know, this is a 995 home project. It's 138 acres. There's a lot of background that, that has to be fully engineered. We're definitely over half of that now being completed. The good thing about this is the clubhouse and the parks are being engineered as we speak, meaning when we go on to subsequent phases, a lot of the infrastructure, if not all of the infrastructure, will be already 100% approved from an engineering level. So I would, I would say another couple months before we get the package for the PDP, give them a couple months approval from there. And then, um, you know, we'll ask the city, we'll try to ask the city a little earlier if we can start some of the grading and, um, and some of the road building. And that's, that's, that is a discretionary issue with the city. It's not a political issue. It's, it's a permitting discretionary issue. But again, on the Altus report, which kind of set the schedule down, and this was the third party validator of the project, both financially and from a timing perspective, they gave the last quarter of 2022 as the time for us to break ground and the first quarter of 2023 for us to build homes. In terms of revenue, these homes are built, they're built like 40 at a time. This is what's, this is called large scale production homes. This does not match what you see in any urban city. This is more indicative if you were driving like in the outskirts of Phoenix, 20, 30 miles outside of Phoenix, and you see like 500 homes go up at once or any, any of the outskirts of a, of a major city that's away from the coast. It's done in a, what we call production home basis. So you'll have like 40 foundations going at once, 40 walls going at once. And we expect revenue from the first homes, probably the homes are probably like 16 to 20 weeks to get built from the day that the concrete's poured to the day that a key is delivered. So your revenue in terms of uh, cash hitting the P&L statement would be probably about five months, five months after that date. So in terms of P&L action, this would be a 2023 line item uh, that will take place and things will then move very, very quickly because again, these are, these are, these are production homes and they, they move at a very, very fast pace once they start. All right. So it looks like we have 60 days left before the precise development plan will be submitted. Then probably one or two months for the council to review it. And then you can start building on the first phase. And then after that, you can build at a tempo of 40 houses a time. And that will be started at near the end of the year. And the revenues will be booked in the fiscal year of 2023. Is that correct? Yeah, you'll, you'll build them in, in roughly in groups of 40 homes, but that will, that they'll be staggered. So you'll do 40 homes and then in, in about uh, five or six weeks, you'll do another 40 homes. So you'll, you'll average, you average about 165 homes a year. That's the schedule. That's not a, that's not a limit imposed by the city. The city's plans were between four to seven years. We gave an average of six with six, it figures out to be about 165 homes a year. So in this case, phase one is roughly, is roughly, I think 164 homes, 163 homes. Other phases are a little larger. Some are a little smar smaller. So there's little pieces of phases that will be done in a given year, but on average about 165 units a year. And, um, and so you'll see this sort of cycle build up. So, you know, you start, you start with 40, 40 foundations, five, six weeks later, you start with another 40 foundations, and then you move the cycle with the completion of phase one. Concurrently with that, you'll have the parks built, you'll have the central park built, you'll have the clubhouse built. So somebody posed a question, you know, why is Pinion Street on the south side so important for the city to complete that at the city's cost, by the way, it's a, I believe it was a federal government grant for about 85% of the million dollars that's being funded by government entities. Well, the reason is this was no longer part of the original plan back in 2006, where it was a kind of a KB home style subdivision where there was one entrance, the entire 
688 homes were contained under one big fence of 138 acres. And it was a cookie cutter design where if you lived, you, you bordered your neighbor on your backyard, you literally had to go in your car and drive, you know, a quarter of a mile, third of a mile to weave through these complicated networks of streets to get to visit your neighbor. In this case, the subdivision was built under the principles of new urbanism, which is traditional laneways and traditional roads. So there'll be 12, 13, 14 roads transecting the entire property. So there'll be 12 entrances and 12 exits to come in. So you can literally ride your bike or you can walk or drive in from any one of the streets that border the project from the west, north, and south. And of course, the high school completely bounds the, the east side. So Pinion Street is part of the southern entrances. And so to have this access to drive in the subdivision is exactly what the city wants. The city does not want one major thoroughfare coming into the project. It wants multiple, multiple exits and multiple entries. So in our case, I, I believe there's at least 10, there might be 11. I just have to, my memory here, but it's around, it's a minimum of 10 different entrances and exits to get into the subdivision. It's not, it's not gated, but it is an individual HOA. So homeowners will belong to an association. The association will be responsible for the parks, for all the facilities, for the sporting facilities, for the landscaping. And that leads to another question that was asked that I had seen on Stockhouse. And that was a question, you know, regarding, you know, deposits, when can deposits be taken in California to be able to take deposits? It's a separate process from the city, the department of real estate, the DRE guy governs that process. And it's called a yellow slip. So when you get your yellow slip, you're able to take non-refundable committed deposits. To be able to take that deposit, you have to have your HOA approval in terms of budget. You need a final budget approval. I mean, these things are always subject to change and they change over time, but you have to have a budget where the reasonableness of the accuracy, at least in a given point of time, is final. And to have that, you need the fully engineered landscaping the design. And again, this is not, this is not a, these aren't the designs that was part of the entitlement. This is the actual hundred percent drawings where the landscape crews, hardscape crews can come in and actually plant the exact amount of trees, you know, the exact amount of flowers and gardening and square footage of grass and anything related to landscaping, including the park areas. It has to be known to the last square foot. So from that detail, you can derive a final landscape budget. And with that landscape budget that merges together with the upkeep of the sidewalks, the roads and the parks, and that final budgetary number is provided to the Department of Real Estate, which on approval, the issue is called the yellow slip. When the yellow slip is issued, then we can take deposits that are non-refundable that are binding. And, and th those become the basis uh, for us to go ahead to VOIA to say, Voya, look, we've collected, uh, we have 65, 70 deposits on the first tranche. So we're going to go ahead with the first 40 homes, release X amount of dollars. Altis reviews the purchase and sale agreements, uh, reviews a general contractor's budget to make sure it's in line, which what was agreed to, and then sends notification to Voya to release the dollars from the escrow construction account. So there's a formal process that, you know, it mimics large, large scale subdivisions do mimic large scale wind farms and large scale solar farms in terms of the infrastructure aspects to it and how the, how the, um, the management of the funding and management of the permits take place. So there is a lot of similarity in how that's taken care of, but again, having these documents done by the engineers, which they're doing right now and sending those to the department of real estate, who we've been communicating with the last three years anyway. It provides the, um, the underpinning from being able to take from what we call the yellow slip, which allows us to take deposits on the project. Okay. You've mentioned the topic of uh, VOIA for the financing. It was a question that was asked for uh, what's the interest rate on the amounts that you will use. I understand that you will use only portions and you pay a reservation fee for the unused parts. Can you shed a light on that, please? Yeah, so I gave a little synoptic on Stockhouse. So in infrastructure finance, and by the way, this, this VOIA money is actually coming from a pool of funds that's coming from their actual green environmental fund. So it's a segregated fund, a specialty fund. It has 
It's funded approximately $450 million, close to half a billion dollars. And uh, it looks for green projects and it, and it's appropriate in this particular fund. When I presented Sage Ranch to Voya, which I did several years ago, originally I presented Sage Ranch to Rabobank because the head lender in the renewable energy division of Rabobank, which was doing, he was doing around 15 billion a year of wind and solar projects and, and biomass, biogas projects across the United States. This person ran the entire department in, out of New York City and, bef- and, and during his, his tenure at, at Robble Bank provided Western Wind with uh, some key loans, uh, which built many of the projects for Western Wind. So it's a long relationship. It's probably about 15 years now. And when Tom moved over from Robble Bank over to Voya, coincidentally, Robble Bank is a large Dutch credit union in, in terms of you're a Canadian. You would look at this more as a uh, Robo Bank being a large credit union of about over one trillion Canadian dollars in assets, and then um, and then he moved over to Voya, and Voya is the U.S. spinoff of ING Direct. So if you probably remember all the ads on television many years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, ING Direct was heavily represented in the United States. They spun off the U.S. division of ING Direct into a name called Voya. And Voya now is, I think, like $730 billion investment manager, close to a trillion dollars Canadian. And when we presented Sage Ranch to Voya, the group of funds that liked the project was the Green Fund, particularly because of the environmental attributes to Sage Ranch. So very close to carbon neutral by having three schools, the high school, which takes up the entire eastern boundary of the property, the elementary school, which is in the southwest corner, and the middle school, which is across the street on the northeast side. You have three schools that you have access to without having to drive a car. So that provides a carbon neutral impact to the project. Then you have the recycling of the gray water, which is now mandatory in California. You have to have solar panels installed in all the roofs, which is now mandatory in California. And then in two years, we're switching over. California will no longer allow gas heaters. So you're switching over to electric heaters. And even though that doesn't take effect for two years, we're not going to start the project with gas heaters and then switch over to electric. We're going to start the electric from the beginning. Smart meters, which I don't know how many people have smart meters. They're, they're very prolific in California. I can go on my phone. I can turn my you know, all my uh, key electrical items off or on, obviously lower the temperature of my house. I can get notices from Southern California Edison that they have their, their load shaping, meaning there's a price advantageous offer to me if I reduce, you know, my air conditioning usage, say from, you know, keeping the house at 70 degrees, move it up to 78. And I, I do that on a notification basis. And then I get a a little cash rebate from Southern California Edison. So, so having smart meters in all the homes and recycling gray water, solar panels, and again, low carbon footprint, this fit all the boxes in the Voya green fund. And so with that, we're being funded through a green fund within Voya, not a real estate fund. So Voya went through all the due diligence that looked at all the key items, including the issues like the water and all these conversations that you've seen on Stockhouse. And Voya was very comfortable that Sage Ranch would move ahead and progress into commercial operation in terms of production, the homes being built and the homes being sold. So it went through their legal approval. Voya would not sign a mandate agreement of that size. Uh, with a company like Voya, if it felt there was any issues with the project. So what happens is when we move along to the precise development plan, as we get closer to pulling our permits, I will then notify Voya that we are ready to complete all the, all the development milestones uh, that you normally do in any housing project. So this is no different than anywhere else in terms of what, what you finish to get ready to build. I notify Voya and then their executive committee then puts the stamp on the release of the $40 million. Once I ask them to do that, Green Bar will pay a penalty of a million bucks if we go and we use somebody else. So you can understand that, right? Their, their credit committee now gone, has now gone through all, all the approval process 
uh, in giving us the money and they've now taken this to the credit committee. Um, they don't want us to use them as a platform, uh, you know, a few days before funding to go somewhere else to go get somebody else's money or if we to choose to do equity. Now, it, it may not meet the, the test of some people here in the audience, but we've done financial analysis as to what equity would look like as compared to debt. We would have to sell, you know, 6 million shares at, you know, six and a half dollars a share US, you know, equity would be cheaper than, than taking on a $40 million line of credit from Voya. So when we notify the credit committee that we're ready to go, and once they then release the $40 million into the escrow construction account, um, we pay a 2% fee on unused money. And for money that we use, actually use, I can't quote the exact amount, but it is a extremely competitive interest rate. And I can tell you that private money in subdivisions of this nature from private lenders is in the 11 to 12% range. And we are much cheaper than the 11 to 12% range. So I, I do have a confidentiality agreement with Voya. I can't give the rate, but it is much cheaper than any other lender that's in this business. And that would make sense because Voya represents pension funds, institutional investors. It's very big in the, in the teacher's pension fund business in the United States. And their expectations are generally in the six to 7% range. That is the expectation across the board. So that, you know, that is most, that is the most I can say about interest rates from Voya, but the, the most important thing with Voya is that Voya is a reliable lender when their legal department reviewed Sage Ranch has looked at the project for the last two years and given us the mandate, this is a lender that we can 100% rely on to get the funds. This is not, you know, this is not private lenders, you know, somebody, a family office with $200 million and, you know, you need, you, just when you need the $50 million, they start changing the terms on the deal. This is not what a $1 trillion, you know, Dutch investment manager does. That's not their attitude. And not, that's not their strategy. So the reliability of getting that money was key to us and also getting it at an extremely competitive rate. So I think Voya has been a really good champion of Sage Ranch and we're very, very proud to work with them. Okay, sounds excellent. I was also expecting a rate around 11% or even more. So it's very good to hear that you've ticked the right boxes to get the financing from Voya for 40 million. So in total, you have a mandate for $235 million. Does that same rate also apply for, for Montalva? Uh, Montalva's rate is even more competitive because the large scale utility business just has a lot more capital. Wind and solar are true in the true definition of an infrastructure asset. So there are a lot of similarities be between Sage Ranch and a, and a large utility scale wind and solar project. You know, the similarities are, you know, permitting, environmental approvals, you know, building things in, in a massive scale. Th there's a lot of similarities where the similarities end is in a wind and solar project, 99% of the time, there's just one customer for 20 years. So you're selling your output, you know, to a utility for 20 years, sometimes 25 in the case of Puerto Rico, 25 with options for five, another five and another five up to 35 years. This is indicative of 99% of the business. So when you have such long-term reliability, because in the case of Sage Ranch, once you build the home and you give the key, the loan is no longer applicable for that one house, right? Every time you give a key, money comes in, that charge on that property is gone. So you're constantly turning over properties, you're turning over cash. If you look at the Altus report, actually goes beyond the requirement. Instead of $30 million, Altus is very conservative. It does not want to disappoint any lender. So it adds an $11 million contingency in case of emergencies. And so the funding that Altus asked for was $40 million again, as a safety net to the lenders, but that gets paid off all within a year, even in Altus's own conservative valuation of Sage Ranch, everything is paid back in one year. So you're not really meeting their long-term obligations that they have with their investors. 
because Voya is not a bank, right? It's an institution who basically looks after pension money. So it really wants long-term commitments. So the shortest duration that we were able to get from Voya was three and a half years. And so a year and a half of having the money being released in, from the construction escrow account, and then two years of having the funds that are repaid in a year, but are actually sitting in the account unused at 2%. That's what we had to agree to, to get the VOIA loan, just simply because it has to have some small resemblance to an institutional lender. The difference is when you get to a solar and wind project, you actually have a 20 year minimum, 20 year obligation by the customer, by the off taker to buy the power. And this perfectly matches pension funds, institutional lenders, uh, even banks. It, it matches their needs to, to secure law, to match long-term obligations. So in that case, it ha there's a lower interest rate. So as an example, when we, in a, in a much, really in a similar interest rate environment. So when I, we built Windstar, which completed in 2012, that really had the same 10 year yield was pretty well the same as what the 10 year yield is today. And we were paying average of 6.95% interest, one price fixed for 20 years. So this, or 21 years, so one year for construction and 20 years on the, on the term loan. So Voya's interest rate, although we can't disclose it for Montalva is much more consistent with the numbers that you see with what the life insurance companies do with large scale wind farms and solar farms. All right. Thank you for that. Another question came in from a loyal shareholder. And it was a good question, actually, because he was mentioning that IRS accounting rules in Canada require to value assets acquisition costs. That's why you have Sage range on the books for roughly 1 million. But US GAAP accounting rules allow to value assets at fair value. He also mentioned that that makes it easier for US companies to list on stock markets. The question is, well, since Greenwire Capital Limited obtained a valuation report from Altus, well, not that long ago. How does this fit into the accounting for going to NASDAQ? Well, it, it has a significant impact. So traditionally, you know, assets are marked at book value. There's exceptions and there's obviously an exception with marketable security. So if you, if you're a public company and you own shares of another public company, that value is marked at the, at the end of that particular period, right? So every quarter you're having a new price and you're having a, a, either a gain or a loss in your financial statement, even though it's not an actual, it's not an actual loss or an actual gain, but you do have a paper loss, paper gain that you have to report in the case of significant changes in value. There is a specific bright line guideline that says that you can adjust your value based on the market price. With the exception of the United States, the world uses what's called IFRS, IFRS, which is Int Int International Finance Reporting Standards, and the U.S. uses U.S. GAAP, which is generally accepted accounting principles. There is a reconciliation between the two, and because we're still officially Canadian and we filed a U.S. registration statement, we ha we had to have our Canadian financial statements adjusted or make made note of any changes, material changes that would differ from U.S. GAAP. It wasn't done in U.S. GAAP, but any confirmation of any different accounting principles were noted in the statements. Both IFRIs and U.S. GAAP does allow a significant change in market value. There's a process for that. And we spoke with the auditors before the year end was due, which was, I think, April 28th, April 27th. Uh, we had a call with two of the auditors on the line. Mm -hmm. And there is a process. So what the process is, is you have to go to a, an accredited valuation company, feasibility company, which Altus is, it's the gold standard, certainly the most dominant in Canada. And it has a very large network in the United States. So if you Google Altus, I believe they have like a $2 billion market cap. They are prolific in some major areas in the U S but they're very extremely dominant in Canada. So Altus came up with a feasibility report of the entire package. They, they give a, a lot of what we call haircuts. So in other words, if they look at the market prices for homes, they'll cut that price down. When they look at 30 inputs in building homes, lumber, electrical, plumbing, you know, concrete, wood, drywall, 
they'll increase those numbers. So they'll come up with an extremely conservative valuation. And with that valuation, they came up with 174 million US dollars in profit over the six year life of the project. And with a 6% discount, it came up to 124 million US. So with that, we can adjust now our balance sheet to show, instead of showing 1.6 million Canadian as the value for Sage Ranch, because that's our actual book cost, we can show 124 million US and the equivalent. So let, let's say the equivalent today is $157 million Canadian. So that is a significant difference from where the balance sheet is today. So the question is, how does it help us? How does it not help us? From the perspective of helping us, there's a lot of investors who do not know infrastructure assets. They really don't know real estate. They don't read the notes to financial statements. They don't look through news releases and they do the old simple thing that people did 30 years ago. They quickly go through the balance sheet and the P&L statement. And, and that's obviously not applicable to any action that a company is doing if it has serious development assets that are simply booked at cost. Perfect example was Western Wind, the company that I had before that I sold for over $400 million cash to Brookfield Asset Management. If you looked at the financial statements in, in Western Wind, you would have seen nothing there of any value because the value was in the power purchase agreement, but you could only market for the few hundred thousand dollars in legal fees that was used to acquire the power purchase agreement. We, we spent legal fees and we we're able to, to market in the financial statements. But even then we basically expensed it out. So we expensed everything out. So you couldn't, re, you couldn't see any value on the balance sheet whatsoever. Now it worked to our advantage because when the projects were built, as soon as they got built, of course, we were taken over by Brookfield. They didn't, they didn't wait one year to show income on the, on the financial statements. They knew that once the public starts, you know, gets the simplified version of what's going on, that there'll be a whole different market response. And so they made their, their acquisition before all the revenue numbers hit the, state, uh, hit the financial statements. So in the case of the market, it doesn't really know really what's going on. And we, we can obviously tell that in the market price. There's nobody in the market paying attention to anything that, that Greenbrier is doing. So when you, we pass out information, you go look at the financial, you say, would well, you, you know, the Sage Ranch, it sounds good, but maybe, you know, maybe it's a hoax. Maybe it's too good to be true. It's hard to ignore that in financial statements because financial statements, you're a public company, you have a public auditor. Now we're registered in the United States. We're getting our final approval in the next three, four weeks. When that happens, I mean, the amount of, the amount of legal responsibility and disclosure that you have in the U S and the penalties that you have for, you know, for m making a misstatement is quite severe. So by showing 157 million Canadian really have really helps um, investors understand that there's something there without them having to go to the Altus report, without them having to go to the website, you know, without them really having to roll up their sleeves. So the downside, and of course the upside too, is it helps with the NASDAQ listing because there's exemptions. You don't have to have $4 if you meet certain asset requirements. So it, it lowers the price entry point significantly for an NASDAQ listing. So I'll, I'll move over to NASDAQ before I move over there. Well, let's complete this slot on, on the balance sheet. The downside is you have to have the Altus report done every quarter. So Altus is literally monitoring the feasibility study that they performed, and they're probably monitoring it every month. They're not going to just do it at the end of a quarter. They're going to, they're going to do a reconciliation every month. And then every quarter, they're going to have a new number. And on top of that, you have to then go back. And all this has to do a report on what the land was worth a year ago and two years ago. So it is a large amount of work. It's probably, you know, six months, seven months worth of work by all to do that. And then every quarter, you're going to get a change in the value of the project. And it can easily be to the benefit, but it's still, it's going to be a change. And so the change is reflected either in a net, in a, a, an accounting net loss or a net gain subject to cost of materials, subject to the value of homes, what's happening on the ground. So that, that happens on a quarter by quarter basis. So there's a lot of backend documentation that's done once you elect to put the market value on the financial statement. So, so we, we do have one or two board members, senior board members that are 
you know, weighing that implication for the whole team and saying, look, this is sort of the realism of, you know, what the amount of work to do is to get it there. Nobody's saying no. I prefer it's there because it just makes it easier for investors. A lot of investors don't go and look at the website. They don't make referrals to other documents. They don't read a note to the financial statement. They don't look at news releases. So for me, I believe, and a lot of people do believe that it's a positive statement. We don't have anybody in the company saying no. We just, we have an awareness, including our chief financial officer of the amount of work that's done then now to maintain that standard. In terms of NASDAQ, the biggest process with NASDAQ was not the application itself. The biggest process is what's called the full registration statement. So if you're an American company, it's called a Form 10. If you are a foreign company, it's the same document in terms of the amount of work and disclosure. There's no difference in disclosure or work, but they call it a Form 20F. And what it is, it's a, the summary document is 100, 120 pages long, but behind it is every material contract that the company's ever been in, in our case, 13, 14 years, every financial statement, anything that was ever published is all put together in this massive file and it's reviewed by the analysts. So we had an initial set of deficiencies, I think about two months ago, you know, they were like five or six pages long. A lot of it is just explanation and, and, you know, questions to reconcile things. And the last deficiency letter was about three weeks ago. And there was only three questions. And it was, it was reconciliation of two or reconciliation of line items in the investor deck that, that our investor deck has to match what's in the registration statement. And the other was the, the summary, the most current leases of the, all the projects, all the land holdings in Montalva, instead of going back 13 years for every lease option agreement that was there before that. And so we've elected to take just the current ones because the current ones are the ones that are relevant. These are the parcels of land that we can build on with land that we have the legal rights to uh, versus things that happened uh, 12, 13 years ago. So the, the filing was made, I believe it was made yesterday or today. If it comes back with the approval, then we're fully registered in the US and then we can pick the exchange we want to go to. That's based on, uh, as you know, pricing and it's also based on financial statements. So that's why the having the accounting policy where we can adjust the statements has an impact uh, on what we can do. Uh, and we're, and we're seriously considering that on what's going on, but we should have, we should have approval within three weeks from the SEC final approval. I mean, if they do ask us to file every contract for the last 13 years, we'll do it. We do, we, we, we are allowed uh, for privacy re reasons, competitive reasons to have redactions. So obviously we'd redact things that are proprietary in nature. But all in all, I'm looking at three to four weeks to get final SEC approval on the, um, on the full registration statement. Then we can look around for what exchange and what to do with both our share price and our financial statements to, to assist us in that objective. All right. That's very good news that is coming soon about the 124 million on the balance sheet, as well as the NASDAQ listing. A few questions by Paul Morris Gallagh Williams. There was a news release a year ago about the regional real estate agency acquisition that you proposed for the ownership of the then regional Keller Williams offices that Mr. Morris is managing. Are there any updates on that topic? Yeah, there is. So we have, you know, we've been working behind the scenes, our lawyers on that acquisition. We have to present that acquisition to the owner of Keller Williams, which is Gary Keller. Gary's aware that we're working behind the scenes. That was about a year ago that Gary was informed that we're working on putting a deal together to take public through Greenbrier as a conduit. Paul's 3,400 real estate agents that he has under his license, as well as $165 million of commission income. So that is in the works. We're getting down. This is a long, long project. You can imagine the amount of work, 3,400 real estate agents and the amount of documentation. We are getting close to what would be the final agreement. We would not put a news release out. We would submit that document, those documents. Yeah. Well, one major purchase and sale agreement. And there's obviously underlying supporting things, but the major purchase and sale agreement, we would provide that confidentially to Gary Keller and he would then have 60 days to either accept it or, 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 or buy it out. 
you know, it's not, it's not a happy moment for him because when you're peeling off real estate agents into a separate public company, the valuation perspective is different than if it's valued on his own book. So, so just a quick lesson in real estate here. So um, you have a publicly traded real estate company called EXP. Their symbol is EXPI in, in the, in, in, on NASDAQ. So they, their market cap roughly, roughly is around $100,000 of market cap per agent. So that would be, I think their last count, they had 57,000 agents. I don't know what their market price is today. I haven't looked at their stock price in about a month, but it's again, it's EXPI. And so the average value at about $100,000 per agent was giving them a $5.7 billion market cap. It was as high as like 11, 12 billion about a year ago, year and a half ago. The reason they get that value is because all of the commission income from the EXP agents, they flow up to the corporate parent. And then once the, once it's at top to, once the cash is at, at the very top at the, with the corporate parent, the corporate parent then pays down the net commissions to all the brokers. And the net result is your net profit. The net profit is actually quite slim. I think it was, I think for EXPI, I think it was maybe on an annualized basis, maybe 30 or 60 million for the year, one of those two numbers. So it was very, very slim. You know, this is a, this is a, a penny business where the margins are very tight, but it's a huge volume business. So again, I think their last count was two and a half billion uh, dollars in commission income. And from that is there's a margin for, for what's the profit, but the market was giving them, uh, was running pretty well consistent for a long time at a hundred thousand dollars of the U hundred thousand U S dollars of market cap per agent. So as we, as we look into the opportunity with Paul Morris, 3,400 agents that he owns under his licenses, that's three, 340 million us in market cap. Gary Keller's chagrin to that would be that his own valuation, uh, would be only $10,000 per agent because the way Gary set up his, his franchise system back in 1987, I believe 87 was that he would not own the, the franchises. He would only get a little royalty of what each independent franchise would do. So franchises became known as what's called market centers and market centers were owned by individual people who were in the real estate business and the, all the cash would flow there and stop there and they would pay their bills and then have their net income. He would get a tiny little royalty of that. So his royalty income has changed the the scope of his valuation so his valuation you know as an example could be as low as ten thousand dollars per agent because he's simply not getting their revenue and and so there's a law a legislated piece of law in california and it's a also under it's underpinned by a a a, a supreme court case in in the state of california that you could not stop a franchise holder from selling any franchise to another person or another entity um, that has some experience in the business. So if Paul Morris was to come on the board of Greenbrier as co-CEO, there's no argument that Gary could make under California law that Greenbrier is not in the real estate business. So the only cutout to the entire Keller Williams franchise system in the United States is the state of California. It's the only place where franchise holders can actually sell to a related party to themselves or to another party that simply is, has management that's real estate individuals. So that there is a huge hindrance on, on Gary saying no. Now he's going to get the proposal. He can, he's going to try to make some arguments and we would rather have those arguments to be done in a private, on a private basis, not on a public basis. So when the, when the acquisition is filed to Gary, um, it will not be made public because until he says yes or no, it, it's irrelevant for the Greenbrier shareholder. Because if he says no and writes the check to Paul for the equivalent or simply says, hey, I've, I've got my own Greenbrier. So here, I'm going to give you my own Greenbrier stock. He has to match the equivalent offer that we made. If he does that, then the whole conversation is a private conversation and it should not be made public. So the, the conversation about Keller Williams will be, will be made public 
only if he doesn't elect to buy the franchises and Paul Morris's real estate empire is put into Greenbrier. So that will be the only time that we'll make that news public. So that's the, that's the update to the best of my ability on what's going on there.